Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Alicia with Chariot Solutions, and I'm here to introduce Ron Plessler, Pressler talking about Project Loom. Take it away. Hello, uh, and thank you. Uh, so, hi, uh, my name is Ron Pressler. I work at Oracle on OpenJDK, uh, which is the best known implementation of the Java platform, as the technical lead for Project Loom, which is the subject of this talk. Um, Project Loom is uh, OpenJDK's attempt to modernize concurrency on the Java platform. So let's start by uh, discussing what concurrency is. Uh, the definition I like using, uh, and it is also the one recommended by the ACM, is that concurrency is the problem of scheduling a largely independent uh, set of tasks onto a limited set of computational resources. And that is in contrast to parallelism, which is a problem of performing one task faster by splitting it uh, into multiple pieces and getting multiple calls uh, to cooperate on solving it. So keep in mind, uh, our concurrency is about competition, var various different things over resources, and parallelism is uh, uh, cooperation to make solving one job faster, but we're not going to be talking about parallelism, only about concurrency. Um, now, concurrency in Java uh, usually means threads. And threads are a fundamental component, not only in the language, where and, 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 and they are important to the language because the, uh, the meaning of doing things sequentially in Java uh, means doing them sequentially in a thread or uh, when we say uh, when we split to a new thread, that that's how in Java we say to do things concurrently. But in fact, uh, they're also fundamental in all layers of the platform. So troubleshooting context uh, that is ca captured by uh, exceptions is a thread stack trace. Uh, and in the debugger, uh, when we single step through a program, we're actually single stepping through a single thread. Uh, profilers. Um, the JFR, which is the, the, the main profiling framework uh, in the JDK today, uh, organize their output by threads. They tell you how, how time is spent per thread. So the notion is central to the language, the runtime, and the tooling. Now, threads in Java are represented by the thread class, the Java Lang thread class. But uh, while the Java specification does not mandate it, uh, the most popular implementation of Java, the one most people have used for the last 25 years, and is now called OpenJDK, uh, implements threads as uh, thin wrappers around the OS thread. So the, the way threads are implemented in OpenJDK is basically to use the OS thread. And OS threads are expensive, uh, by which I mean that uh, we cannot have too many of them, maybe a few thousand active ones, uh, maybe 10,000 active ones, but that's about it. Um, and the reason for that is that the OS doesn't know uh, doesn't know the, the various languages. And the, the most um, costly component of a thread is its stack. And uh, the operating system doesn't know how the various languages it must support makes use of the stack. So it must uh, address the worst case and allocate a very large stack. It's usually on a, on a megabyte scale. Um, and even though we use uh, a virtual memory and not all of it is commit committed to physical memory, uh, once uh, we touch a page, it becomes committed. It can't be uncommitted, again, because the OS doesn't know how the stack is used. And uh, in any event, all the operations are done at a page granularity, which is 4K. It's also not, not that small. Uh, and uh, to do uh, task switching, we need to uh, switch to the kernel. Uh, and the algorithm that chooses in, in the kernel that chooses uh, which threads to run right now on which uh, CPU core is uh, a compromise for all possible uses uh, in the system. And of course, different threads can do very different things. So a thread that um, handles transactions coming over the network uh, behaves very differently from a thread that does, um, um, say, uh, video encoding. Um, so 
we said Java is built around threads and uh, the simplest way to write a Java server. So when we talk about concurrent, concurrent applications, we usually talk about servers uh, because servers need to uh, handle uh, many different requests um, concurrently. So the, the simple thing to do and, and the way Java programmers ha have been trained to do since Java 1.0 over uh, 25 years ago is uh, to write a synchronous model, sometimes called a thread per request. And, and what you do is uh, you start and end uh, handling an incoming request on a single thread. Uh, and it fits very well with the language. I say it is harmonious with the language. It's harmonious with the platform and the tooling. Everything knows about this concept of you do so something start to finish on a thread, but it holds on to a thread for the entire duration. And uh, threads are expensive because we can't have too many of them. So uh, that means that we do not make um, optimal use of, uh, of uh, the, the hardware resources. So uh, what do we do when we have uh, a costly resource? Uh, that's right, we share, recycle, and reuse them. Uh, the first thing we can do uh, to uh, reuse threads is to say, instead of spawning a new thread for every incoming request, uh, we uh, have a pool of threads that we borrow when an incoming request comes in, we borrow a thread and uh, we use it to run the request and then we return it to the pool so that a different, a different uh, uh, transaction can use it. Uh, this is done, if you Java programmers, this is done using uh, executors, right? We submit a task to the executor, it essentially borrows a thread, executes starts to finish, start to finish on that thread, and then returns the thread to the pool. Uh, that uh, in itself uh, already introduces uh, several uh, tricky issues. The first is that uh, sometimes we want to use uh, thread locals to part some um, implicit context, uh, like uh, the current user. And once you start sharing threads and, and you have different tasks running on the same thread, it's possible to accidentally, uh, if, if we forget to clean up, to accidentally leak some information in the thread local from one task to another. And this is potentially even a security vulnerability. Uh, another problem is that canceling, if, if, we, if we run a, a task on, on a, in a thread pool and we want to cancel it, uh, things become complex because uh, we need to ask the task which thread are you running on? And then we need to interrupt that thread. And by the time we're trying to interrupt that thread, that task might have released that thread and, it, and that thread could have been reused by another task and now it's running a different task. And that different task will get the interrupt. So that means that all our code that handles, with, it handles interruption needs to, uh, needs to uh, 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 consider the possibility that it's receiving an interrupt signal that wasn't addressed to it, so it's furious. It makes handling it more complex. But worst of all, this doesn't even solve that problem because even though we don't need to spawn a new thread every time, uh, while a task is running start to finish, it is still hanging on to a thread. And that means that we're limited by the maximum number of threads the OS can give us, which is far less than the number of, uh, say, um, uh, uh, sockets we can have, right? So we can have a million sockets in a server, but only a few thousand threads. So uh, we try to uh, share threads on a, on a finer grain level. And instead of returning the thread to the pool for the benefit of other tasks, only when we're done handling the transaction, uh, we can return the thread to the pool every time we don't need to actually run on the CPU. Uh, so while we are blocked, while we are waiting for IO, um, say we're doing a, an HTTP client call to a microservice, we say we, we want to return the thread to the pool to be used by other tasks. But in order to do that, we need to use an entirely different set of APIs because the, um, the normal IO APIs are blocking, which means that uh, when we want to say read from a socket, the way they're built is that you're staying on the same thread while uh, while that while you're waiting, so we need to use those asynchronous APIs. Uh, they're completely incompatible with uh, with the synchronous APIs, and we essentially have to write our entire application in this way. And 
Uh, I mentioned before that uh, the troubleshooting in exceptions and uh, stepping through the debugger and uh, looking at profile wrap output, uh, they all consider the thread to capture uh, our context, what it means to do one thing. And once we start breaking it up too much, uh, we lose that context. So if you ever use these asynchronous APIs, you see that um, uh, if you get an exception, it doesn't really tell you where you are. It's not very useful. So it's very scalable. It can make good use of all the resources, but it's very, that code is hard to read, hard to write. Um, you have to change your entire application and it is nearly uh, impossible to profile. In fact, uh, uh, one of the biggest problems is that you can have a very busy machine uh, where all of it is, say, doing I.O., but if you try to get a profile output, you just see that all your thread pools are idle. Uh, and you don't know that there are operations in progress uh, waiting for I.O. because nothing tracks those operations. They're not their own threads. So uh, uh, developers are, are forced to choose between uh, two bad options. Uh, they can write a simple code that's very harmonious with the platform, but it's less scalable. So in that case, they need to waste money on buying more hardware uh, because they're not making good use of the, of the service they have. Or they can choose to say, we want to make good use of the hardware, but then they need to spend much more time on development and, and maintenance and, and uh, uh, um, uh, observability, et cetera. So uh, when do you want to waste your money? Uh, and the way to break this dilemma is to say uh, that we'd like to have something that is thread-like and has all the benefits of threads, but it's cheap. Um, okay, but uh, now the question is, what is that lightweight thread-like construct that we want? Uh, different languages have chosen uh, two basic approaches for lightweight thread-like thingies. Uh, we have Erlang and Go on the one hand, uh, and what they do is they essentially implement threads um, in their own runtime, rather than, uh, so, so it's the same abstraction of a thread, but it's not implemented by the OS. And the reason they can make that more lightweight is because the, the language runtime knows how the language makes use of the stack. Uh, but more recently, other languages, uh, starting with C-sharp, have chosen to offer uh, a completely new construct, um, and in fact, a completely new syntactic construct uh, that I call syntactic coroutines, but is mostly familiar to us as async await, so that's how I'm going to call it. Uh, async await is uh, something that is thread-like, but it is a completely distinct syntactic category. Um, so uh, when you write, so it, when you write a piece of code uh, to get a similar behavior to uh, to subroutines running on threads, you have to say what I'm writing is not a subroutine that would run a thread, but this coroutine, asynchronous coroutine that would run inside this asynchronous construct. And when you use those um, units that are distinct from subroutines. Um, you also, in some languages, you also have to call them in a certain way, sometimes with a, with a keyword await before them. Um, so they basically give you the same thing as a thread, but you have to use a completely different syntax. And when you write the code, you have to choose. Do you, do you want to use a thread or do you want to use this async await thing? And the question is, uh, why, why do they do that? Uh, on, its, on its face appears that uh, what Erlang and Go do is much simpler. Um, so it turns out that there are a few subtle differences between async and await, and a few major differences in the implementation that might lead different languages to make different choices. Um, let me see if there are any questions here so far. No. Okay. Um, so um, one difference is that uh, a thread and async awaits have a different default regarding scheduling points. Those are the points in the execution, points in the code, where a different um, concurrent thing is allowed uh, to run. So it's uh, a point in the code where the code we're running can be suspended and the CPU can run something else. Uh, 
uh, for threads, the scheduler is allowed, it doesn't have to, but it's allowed to interleave another thread anywhere except where we explicitly forbid it with a uh, critical section normally expressed as, say, a lock. With async await, the default is opposite. Uh, interleaving can happen nowhere except where we explicitly allow it with await. Now, the former, the default of uh, given by threads, is better uh, because of correct for correctness reasons. Um, the correctness of concurrent code depends on assumptions uh, around atomicity and where these scheduling points can happen. So the first option uh, allows us to say that this block must be atomic and we, we put a critical section there and we don't care what all the methods in the chain that we call do. this is atomic, nothing else can interleave. Uh, but with the latter, it's the opposite. Uh, if we want to add uh, a blocking point, say we want to add some IO operations to one of those coroutines in the chain, uh, we have to um, percolate them up all the way to the top. And when we reach the top, we don't know whether it's okay or not to add a scheduling point because uh, our caller has not expressed whether or not it's okay. With threads, you can express and say, this has to be done in a critical section and async await doesn't give you that. Um, but regardless of uh, personal preferences, some people might think that actually the latter is, is uh, uh, they like it better. Uh, many languages already have threads. So if a language has both threads and async await, then scheduling can happen anywhere. Uh, so now you're just introducing another mechanism uh, and, you, and you're just complicating matters. So you might want to ask, why would you do it? So one good reason is that some languages don't have threads or rather they have just one thread uh, and normally they don't have interleaving. So JavaScript is one such example. All existing code that, that's been written, written before JavaScript got async await in the 20 or so years uh, was written with the assumption that interleaving happens nowhere because JavaScript is single threaded. And now all of a sudden you're introducing concurrency into JavaScript. So because the correctness of all the code that exists in JavaScript uh, might assume uh, that uh, uh, everything is atomic, we must make um, interleaving explicit. So this makes sense for JavaScript. Um, okay, so async await makes sense for JavaScript. Um, the second difference is actually not in the behavior, external behavior, but in the implementation. If we want to implement uh, threads in user mode in the language runtime, uh, it requires that we have access and that we can manipulate the representation of the ordinary, right, uh, uh, threads can have ordinary subroutines on uh, an ordinary call stack. And it means that we need to have access to how that call stack is represented. Um, and that means that we need to have access to the compiler's backend to know how uh, how subroutines are compiled. And that is a very low level implementation detail. We, we, we have to touch the backend. On the other hand, async await uh, is a completely separate, completely new syntactic construct. And um, all that's required to implement it efficiently is control over the compiler's front end. Um, and then what we can do is we can choose to compile uh, each of those units, each of the, let's call them coroutines, each of those coroutines, <clears throat> not to a single subroutine, but we can compile them into multiple subroutines. Or in some cases, as in Rust, we can compile multiple coroutines into a single subroutine. Um, but anyway, that decision is entirely done in the front end and the back end doesn't need to know about it. Um, and working just at the front end level is not only much less work, but some languages don't have control of the backend and they don't have access to the low level representation of subroutines. So they just have no choice. They couldn't implement uh, threads in user mode efficiently, even if they wanted to. Um, so uh, Kotlin is one such example, right? So Kotlin compiles to Java bytecode. It's just a front end, but that's where it ends. It has no influence, no access to, to the Java backend. 
Um, and uh, it also compiles to JavaScript. And it also doesn't have access to the JavaScript backend. And it compiles to Android, and it doesn't have access to the Android backend. So this is why async await is uh, the, the only, ten, the only uh, possible choice for Kotlin. Um, another difference is uh, uh, allowing or disallowing certain constructs that we today accept, expect on threads, but could cause complication. So um, when we do uh, recursion, and normal subroutines are expected to be able to do recursion, um, then we don't know how big the stack is going to get. We don't know statically when we compile the program because we don't know what the depth of the stack we're going to need. Uh, similarly, when we do virtual calls, we don't know which um, concrete target is going to be called. So we don't know if we don't know which subroutine is actually going to be called, we just call through an interface. Uh, we don't know how much uh, room on the stack it's going to need. Uh, and that means that in order to implement threads, which, are, which we expect uh, support these two things, um, we would either need a very large stack, uh, which is what the OS gives us, but that's the very reason why we don't want threads, because we want to make them, oh, we don't want very large stacks because we want to make them cheaper. For that, we need resizable stacks. And uh, resizable stacks has some, uh, ha have some issues, which I'll get to. Uh, but if we have async await, we can say, you know what, async await are a new thing. They're not subroutines, they're coroutines, and they have their own rules. So uh, for example, in, in Rust, you can't, do, um, uh, you can't do recursion and um, uh, virtual calls unless you wrap them a special way. Uh, when you use coroutines. Um, and uh, that is indeed uh, why C++ and Rust do it. And the reason that they have problem with uh, resizable stacks is that uh, the way those languages manage memory, uh, they don't have a garbage collector. Uh, managing memory is much more um, sensitive in those languages. Um, and in fact, it could be even slower um, so they want to know in advance how much stack they're going to need. Um, and uh, it is also, if, if, if you want to resize a stack, um, you might need to move it around in memory. Right? You say, now I, I want to grow, uh, you need to allocate someplace else in memory and move things around. Uh, and that means that if on your stack you have pointers that point into the stack, you have to know where they are and fix them. And that is nearly impossible to do uh, especially if you have FFI calls to other languages. Um, and that is also the case with C++ and Rust. Uh, you might have those internal pointers uh, and you can't move uh, stuff in memory. And when you do async ways, then either you don't need to move it in memory or you can disallow FFI or both. Um, so uh, for those languages, uh, it's simpler to, to say, we have a new construct which has different limitations. Okay, so um, in Java, we have full control of the backend. Uh, we don't, uh, doing FFI ha does happen, but the, we very rarely do IO in FFI. So, so we sometimes need to do JNI calls to C, but we very rarely use it to do IO. So we don't need to block the thread there. And that is a point where all the interesting bits of implementation of managing the stack takes place when we block. Um, that is very rare, almost inexistent in Java. Uh, we don't have pointers into the stack, so we don't need to manage them. Uh, stack resizing is transparent. We don't care where we allocate memory. We don't care about how it's deallocated. The GC takes care of, uh, takes care of it for us uh, very efficiently. And uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, threads are already in the platform. When we have async await, we need to teach all the tools about them. So uh, when C Sharp added async await, and I think it took them years to add full support for them in the debugger, and uh, Kotlin is just adding uh, debugger support now. Uh, and uh, I don't know about C Sharp, but uh, if you try to profile, uh, say Kotlin coroutines, then the, the profile doesn't know about them. Uh, so you'll get a meaningless profile. Um, and 
uh, but even if but even if you even if Kotlin could change the 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 profilers, it will need to teach them about a new thing. In this way, existing debuggers would mostly just work. Uh, JFR and profilers would mostly just work. They already know about that. They, they have this concept. You don't need to teach them something new. So uh, for Java, it's very simple. Uh, the answer is user mode threads like Go and like Erlang, and that is what we've done. So, um, even though we have something uh, that, that is a user mode thread, uh, what is the API that we're going to use for it? Uh, are we going to introduce something new or are we going to reuse the existing thread API? So here we need to balance two uh, opposing forces. Uh, on the one hand, we want to, um, to enjoy something we call forward compatibility. It's great if existing code that doesn't know about a new feature would be able to benefit from a new feature uh, with no changes or with minimal changes. An example of that was in Java with um, lambdas. So all existing code that made use of uh, uh, certain interfaces like runnable or callable uh, automatically became, uh, you, you could automatically call it with lambda, even though it wasn't written with that in mind. Uh, and that's great. Um, it doesn't take years for the, for the ecosystem to, to adopt a new, a new feature. On the other hand, if we introduce a new feature that is, uh, we know is going to be very attractive, it's often an opportunity to, to correct past mistakes and, and, and clean stuff up. Um, and in the case of threads, uh, the thread class has been in Java since Java 1.0. Um, it's accumulated a lot of craft over the years. Um, and we could say, okay, now we're starting fresh uh, without all this baggage. So uh, we wanted to look at, uh, we, we wanted to decide, are we doing something new or are we keeping, uh, are we going to represent this, these user mode threads in uh, using the Java length thread class? So what we learned is that th certain aspects of the API uh, are used everywhere. And if we don't support them, if you're Java programmers, uh, then uh, it's getting the current threads or we're using thread locals. Um, if we wouldn't support them, then very little existing code would run on this new thread, lightweight user mode thread thing. Uh, Ron, can you hear me? Yeah, I think you lost me there. Uh, yep, just a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, right. Can you see this now? Yep, I can see it, thanks. Okay. Sorry about that, I don't know. Right, uh, so um, certain aspects of the thread API are very heavily used. Uh, we must support them the same way. Others, and, and that includes all the baggage I mentioned, uh, is not used directly at all because uh, ever since Java 5, I don't remember how many years ago, uh, we've encouraged people to use different APIs. They don't use a thread API directly. Uh, people very rarely do a new thread or thread at start. Uh, they use rather uh, executors, futures, um, rather APIs that wrap threads. So they don't notice all the baggage. Um, and over time, we could deprecate and remove some unused thread methods. So um, we've realized that uh, the cost of keeping the old Java length thread class uh, is actually quite small. And we've decided uh, that uh, that class is going to also represent this new kind of thread, which we've decided to call virtual threads. Uh, virtual threads, uh, because they're supposed to evoke uh, an analogy to virtual memory. So uh, just as in virtual memory, you have the illusion of uh, some huge amount of memory that then uh, is mapped by the OS to uh, much more limited um, uh, physical memory, so virtual threads, you get basically an unlimited number of threads and the Java runtime takes care of uh, actually uh, using a much smaller number of uh, OS threads. So uh, when you create a thread in Java with Project Loom, uh, you decide whether you want it to be an OS thread, which we call a platform thread or a virtual thread. Uh, and uh, the Java runtime can uh, implement the virtual threads in a very efficient way. Um, 
because it knows exactly how the stacks are used. Uh, so they can be very small and they grow and shrink. Um, and we do context switching in user mode. We don't have to go to the kernel. Uh, and we can even allow users to supply their own schedulers, uh, the most advanced users probably, um, to uh, fit the scheduler to their precise use case. Uh, although the default scheduler would be uh, quite good for most transaction processing use cases. So uh, we have, from the perspective of a Java program, you'd be able to create an unlimited a million virtual threads. Uh, don't worry about it. The cost of creating one is the same as cost of creating a string. Uh, so don't worry about it. Just create a new thread. Uh, and But what the operating system sees, all of those are scheduled onto a very small set of uh, platform threads, which carry the virtual threads on top of them. Uh, all that is done behind the scenes. Um, some of you might know, remember that uh, early on in Java's history, back in Java 1.0, certain implementation of the JVM had something called green threads. Uh, but what they did, they also implemented Java thread in user mode. If you remember, I said that uh, the Java specification does not require that today that threads uh, be implemented as OS threads. Uh, it's up to the JVM to choose. Uh, so very, very early JVMs actually use green threads, but they only employed just one, um, just one uh, OS thread. Uh, these days, then for the last twenty something years, we've had uh, ordinary platform threads that uh, every Java length thread mapped one to one to an OS thread, and virtual threads is many to many, but many more virtual threads. Um, so what happens? Uh, you as, as, as programmers, uh, you program these virtual threads the same way as you would any other thread, because virtual threads are threads, um, except you don't need to worry about the cost of uh, holding on to a virtual thread while you're blocked because um, uh, they're cheap. And how is that done? So. Uh, uh, you're running regular code in Java, you want to do some blocking IO method. Uh, and then at runtime, we check to see, are you running in a virtual thread or in a platform thread? If you're running in a virtual thread, we just suspend the virtual thread. Uh, we tell the OS not to do a blocking IO operation, but rather a non-blocking operation. We release the carrier platform thread uh, to... Uh, and we schedule a different virtual thread on top of it. And when the IO operation completes, uh, we uh, submit the virtual thread back to our scheduler. And from your perspective, it's just as if you ran an ordinary thread, you block for a while, and uh, th then your operation is done, uh, except it's cheap and you don't need to worry about it. Uh, so uh, you can understand from this that we basically had to, to lift the entire structure of, of the JDK, replace the foundation, and then bring it back down without anyone noticing on top. So, uh, so that if you use uh, concurrent, uh, all the Java to concurrent classes that uh, block for synchronization, or we use any of the existing IO classes in the JDK, uh, whether they're in NIO or in legacy of IO, um, all of them actually do the right thing when uh, when virtual threads are used. A few caveats, uh, in some cases, the operating system, like working with files, depending on the operating system, um, sometimes uh, we do not have uh, uh, an unblocking operation, uh, but the scheduler tries to compensate for that. So all these and many more, actually, all of these classes uh, were changed under the cover, but their API remained the same. So you don't actually need to learn anything new. You already know how to use virtual threads, but you need to uh, unlearn a few habits um, that um, uh, people have, have become accustomed to using uh, because threads used to be expensive. Um, and uh, virtual threads are threads also when it comes to tooling. So you can step through them in the debugger. Uh, JFR knows about them. Um, so you, you will no longer see that your system will scale uh, just like one written in the asynchronous style. But uh, if you run a profiler, you'll see what your threads are doing. 
Uh, you can get you can get stat traces. I will mention something about that later. Uh, think about uh, what are you going to do with a thread dump of a million threads, right? It has to be. Um, we need to we need to make it easier to understand. So uh, even though we're just uh, downsizing threads, um, this has implications on how we code, right? You could you could think you could say that uh, smartphones are just uh, miniaturized uh, mainframes, but they're not B because they're miniaturized and they use just by one person at a time. So um, there are different habits. Uh, one of the things you need to unlearn is using thread pools. There is never, ever, ever a need to pool virtual threads. If you're pooling virtual threads, you're doing it wrong. Uh, you can use executors, but it's better to use an executor that creates a new thread for every task you give it, because creating new threads is essentially free. Uh, and we've added that. Um, so even though you know all the APIs, it will take a while for people to internalize what it means that they can create as many threads as they like. Imagine if you have a, um, uh, an incoming request and in order to handle it, you want to do uh, 20 outgoing HTTP client calls um, to uh, 20 microservices and you want them all run to run concurrently. What did you just form 20 new threads uh, just to do those calls on your behalf? Uh, and so even though the abstraction is the same, uh, people need to, to get used to thinking about it differently. So uh, how do we do uh, if today uh, Java Lang friend has about two kilobytes of meter data, uh, stacks are one megabyte by default, doing task switching uh, takes, can be more than one microsecond. Uh, then with uh, virtual threads, the meter data is just only a couple hundred bytes, the stack grows and shrinks uh, depending on what you use. Uh, and context switching is about 200 nanoseconds, although I will get back to that. Uh, that's not actually very important. Uh, yeah, so now I'm getting back to it. Uh, what matters to us when you write concurrent servers is the throughput, the number of, the number of uh, transactions we can process in a, in, in, a, um, in a certain time unit per second, say. And uh, this is governed uh, by something no, known as Little's Law. Uh, it looks very simple, but uh, it, it is actually stochastic. So proving it, I understand, is, is not so simple. But it basically says that the throughput uh, that we can achieve, and that is what we want to maximize, uh, is equal to L, which is our level of concurrency with the number of things we can do uh, at any one time. And so L, you can think of it as the number of friends we can have. Uh, divided by W, and W is the average uh, duration of processing every single transaction. Uh, uh, there is a complication here because uh, when you manage, when you handle a single transaction, like I said, instead of, it, 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 in, if you want to um, uh, contact 20 microservices in order to service it, uh, you might want to do them concurrently, right, like in parallel. Um, so uh, to reduce W, but that actually increases L. So W, you can think of it as the average duration of handling a transaction if all of its operations were done sequentially. Uh, we have very little control over W, but because the, the latency of, of the transaction depends on, I don't know, the latency of our database and other microservices, et cetera. Uh, but uh, virtual threads, what they do is that they can increase L considerably. So L, instead of being equal to 4,000, can now equal 1 million. Um, what's important here is the number L. The cost of task switching uh, actually impacts W, and it impacts it uh, in a very minimal way. Uh, and in fact, I've computed it. I wrote about it in a blog post. Um, so if T is the context switch latency and mu is the uh, average time you wait for IO. So if you wait for IO, um, uh, you know, the fastest IO we have uh, these days with our euring, et cetera, is like four microseconds. So um, if uh, uh, the, the, the impact of task switching is T divided by U, so, even if you have very, very large um, 
um, cost of task switching that takes one microsecond, uh, the impact is going to be 25% uh, T over T over mu. 20, it's going to be 25% if you have the fastest possible IO and the slowest possible task switching. Uh, as I said, we're currently around 200 nanoseconds and most IO is much longer than, 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 um, than uh, uh, four microseconds. So uh, in practice, uh, context switch is not the big impact on performance. The big impact is the number of threads we can have. Um, so perhaps uh, unintuitively, the memory footprint makes much more impact on the throughput than the context switch time. Um, Lastly, uh, the final thing I want to mention is um, when we have this many threads, uh, it would be nice if we had a better mechanism of controlling and organizing. And that uh, uh, is something that uh, we saw, we found elsewhere, something called structure concurrency. Uh, the term was coined by Martin Sustrick. The idea actually dates back uh, longer than that, but. Um, he sort of uh, brought it back. And um, it was then popularized in two uh, great blog posts that I uh, would very much recommend by Nathaniel J. Smith. And the idea of structured concurrency is that every time, so uh, we start doing something sequential, uh, we say we, we receive a request to do a transaction. Every time we split into doing concurrent things, so every time we spawn a new thread to do something in parallel to what we're doing, uh, we don't just fire and forget. We don't say, okay, um, you, I'm going to start you and you, you finish when you finish. Um, in fact, that blog post uh, was uh, uh, titled Go Statements Considered Harmful. Uh, he compared Go Statements in Go uh, that just start up a new user mode thread to uh, go to because they start something and you don't know when it's going to end. So structured concurrency, in contrast, is, is similar to structured programming. When you spawn things to run in parallel, you always wait for them to rejoin um, and you see that in the code. So the runtime behavior, the, what, what, what do we say when we say structured programming? We mean that the runtime behavior of code mirrors the structure of the code text as it is arranged in blocks. So the structure of the code, when we look at it, we see where a control starts and where it ends. And in the case of structured concurrency, we look at the code and we know where threads are created. And most importantly, we know where, where they die. So just to give an example, uh, I mentioned, and with that, I'll finish, I think. Um, so I mentioned that we can, uh, you, you should still use executors, but this new kind of executor, uh, spawns a new virtual thread for every task you give it. It does not pool them. Um, and uh, to enable this structured concurrency, uh, we've uh, changed the executor service to be usable inside these tribal resources blocks. So this block will actually, um, what we'll do, uh, it will wait for all the tasks that have been submitted here. So we submit task one to task two, each of them would run, would spawn and run in its own virtual thread, but we're not going to exit this block until they're both terminated. So we spawn them and then we wait for them. And it's okay to wait for them because we're not wasting the current thread because threads are cheap. Um, this gives us many benefits. One of them is working with deadlines. Working with deadlines is a nightmare because you have to, uh, or, or time maps, right? Time, time maps are even worse. Uh, to make things easier, we translate timeouts to deadlines. We have to thread the time the 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 timeout of the deadline through the entire call chain. They say, okay, this operation we give it uh, I don't know one second, and everyone has to subtract the time that it already took and say, okay, but now you have only eight hundred millisecond, etc. Uh, with this, we can say, okay, uh, give me an executor that would spawn new virtual threads and would um, interrupt all of them if they haven't terminated by then, uh, 30 seconds from now. And then we're going to wait. So if they've both terminated before uh, 30 seconds have elapsed, we can exit this block. Otherwise, um, they will be interrupted after 30 seconds. But either way, we know that when we exit this block, everything here is finished. We do not know this 
when we don't have structured concurrency. Normally, when we submit a task, uh, we need to explicitly wait for it. Um, and this structure could also, it is not currently in the Loom prototype uh, early access, but um, uh, we hope to see it sometime in the future. We'd like to see it uh, also reflected in tools. We always care about the tools. So even though I said that profilers and stack traces and debuggers work with virtual threads as they do before, uh, they do have some UI challenges, right? Because uh, in the debugger, you're used to seeing all of your threads, but now you might have 100,000 threads or maybe a million threads. So even if the ID could present you a list of a million threads, uh, it's not going to be very useful. Um, so what we're thinking of doing, um, and suggesting to the ID vendors to do is that to take advantage of this structure uh, that essentially creates a tree of uh, all the threads. It, it shows you the, the um, relationship between the, the various threads and, and this way it would be much easier to make sense of stack traces and, and uh, debuggers etc and profilers. And with that so I'm done and I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, let's see. Okay, there's one question in the Zoom chat. Uh, how mature is it, this project at this point? Uh, because we've been working on it um, uh, for a few years now. Um, so I would say it is in the home stretch. Uh, we're now talking about you know polishing API, running more. S uh, final performance improvements, um, we need to do, we've started already, but we need to do a port to ARM64, currently the early access is x86 only. It matters, remember, because I said we need to access the, the, the backend, we're actually working with machine code. Um, so I think uh, we're, in the, we're in the home stretch, so uh, soonish. Any more questions? Uh, uh, no questions that I can see either. Um, so we will end early. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. Um, my eye did twitch a little bit when you said uh, a new thread for each task, the executor. That will take some getting used to. Um, but um, that sounds really great, these uh, virtual threads. Um, so thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, enjoy your afternoon and we do have one more talk. Bye.